Okay, so Luke chapter 11. Now it came to pass as he was praying in a certain place when he ceased that one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray just as John also taught his disciples. So he said to them, when you pray, say, our father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us day by day our daily bread and forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who is indebted to us. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. And he said to them, which of you shall have a friend and go to him at midnight and say to him, friend, lend me three loaves. For a friend of mine has come to me on his journey and I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer from within and say, do not trouble me. The door is shut now and my children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give to you. I say to you, though he will not rise and give to him because he is his friend, yet because of his persistence, he will rise and give him as many as he needs. So I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who find, and he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, it will be opened. If a son asks for bread from any father among you, will you give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent instead of a fish? Or if he asks for an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If you, then being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? And as he, and he was casting a, out a demon and it was a mute. So it was when the demon had gone out that the mute spoke and the multitudes marveled. But some of them said, he casts out demons by Beelzebub, the ruler of the demons. Others, testing him, sought from him a sign from heaven. But he, knowing their thoughts, said to them, every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation. And a house divided against, this, uh, divided against a house falls. If Satan is also divided against himself, how will his kingdom stand? Because you say I cast out demons by Beelzebub. And if I cast out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore, they will be your judges. But if I cast out demons with the finger of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. When a strong man fully armed guards his own palace, his goods are in peace. But when a stronger than he comes upon him and overcomes him, he takes from him all his armor in which he trusted and divides his spoils. He who is not with me is against me. And he who does not gather with me scatters. When an unclean spirit goes out of a man, he goes through dry places, seeking rest and finding none, he says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when he comes, he finds it swept and put in order. Then he goes and takes with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself. And they enter and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. And it happened as he was speaking these things that a certain woman from the crowd raised up her voice and said to him, blessed is the woman that bore you and the breasts which nursed you. And he said, more than that, blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. And while the crowds were thickly gathered together, he began to say, this is an evil generation. It seeks a sign. And no sign will be given to it except the sign of Jonah the prophet. For as Jonah became a sign to the Ninevites, so also the Son of Man will be to this generation. The Queen of the South will rise up in the judgment with the men of this generation and condemn them. For she came to the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and indeed a greater than Solomon is here. The men of Nineveh will rise up in the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and indeed a greater than Jonah is here. No one, when he has lit a lamp, puts it in a secret place or under a basket, but on a lampstand, that those who come in may see the light. The lamp of the body is the eye. Therefore, when your eye is good, your whole body also is full of light. 
But when your eye is bad, your body also is full of darkness. Therefore, take heed that the light which is in you is not darkness. If then your whole body is full of light, having no part dark, the whole body will be full of light as when the bright shining of a lamp gives you light. And as he spoke, a certain Pharisee asked him to dine with him. So he went in and sat down to eat. When the Pharisee saw it, he marveled that he had not first washed before dinner. Then the Lord said to him, Now you Pharisees make the outside of the cup and dish clean, but your inward part is full of greed and wickedness. Foolish ones, did not he who made the outside make the inside also? But rather give alms of such things as you have, then indeed all things are clean to you. But woe to you, Pharisees, for you tithe mint and rue all and all manners of herbs and pass by justice and the love of God. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like graves which are not seen and men who walk over them are not aware. Then one of the lawyers answered and said to him, teacher, by saying these things, you reproach us also. And he said, woe to you also, lawyers, for you load men with burdens hard to bear, and you yourselves do not touch the burdens with one of your fingers. Woe to you, for you build the tombs of the prophets, and your fathers killed them. In fact, you bear witness that you approve the deeds of your fathers, for they indeed killed them and you build their tombs. Therefore, the wisdom of God also said, I will send them prophets and apostles, and some of them will kill and persecute, that the blood of all the prophets which was said, shed from the foundation of the world may be required of this generation. From the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, who perished between the altar and the temple. Yes, I say to you, it shall be required of this generation. Woe to you, lawyers, for you have taken away the key of knowledge. You did not enter in yourselves, and those who were entering, and those who were entering in, you hindered. And as he said these things to them, the scribes and the Pharisees began to assail him vehemently and to cross-examine him about many things, lying in wait for him and seeking to catch him in something that he might, that he might say that they might accuse him. I'm going to go into a little bit of chapter 12 here. And in the meantime, when an innumerable multitude of people had gathered together so that they trampled one another, he began to say to his disciples first, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. For there is nothing covered that not, will not be revealed, nor hidden that will not be known. Therefore, whatever you have spoken in the dark, it will be heard in light. And whatever you have spoken in the ear of inner rooms, it will be proclaimed on the housetops. And I say to you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body. And after that, have no more that they can do. But I will show you whom you should fear. Fear him who, after he has killed, has the power to cast into hell. Yes, I say to you, fear him. Are not five sparrows sold for two copper coins? And not one of them is forgotten by God, before God. But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Do not fear, therefore, you are more valuable than many sparrows. And we'll stop there. Really good chapter. Get a little bit into it, a little intense for me. Sorry if I was starting to yell there for a minute, but um, I just, I really did enjoy this chapter and I enjoyed the study that went along with it. Uh, so let's just get right into it. This is session 11 and it's not changing pages there we go the change for you guys yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay so the one key concept that we have here that we've decided to resonate our uh, whole study on of the book of luke is the beginnings in which christ chose to present himself he came in as this very humble poor um just a poverty stricken individual who chose this route so that it was the utmost of humility. And we've asked ourselves, 
every single week, the question was, well, why? Why would he do something like that? And we utilize this verse in Philippians, which is, who being in the form of God did not consider robbery to, robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking on the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as men, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. He did that for you and I. So Luke chapter 11, verses 1 through 13 is called the Lord's Prayer. But what's really happening in this 13 verses is the disciples have asked, how should we pray? So this is actually the disciples' prayer because this is how the Lord instructs them to pray. And so I'm not going to read through it here. This is the whole section because we're going to break it down line by line. So number one, when we're praying, who are we praying to? We're praying to our father that's in heaven. That's, this is God, the father, the creator of everything, right? Uh, <laughs> yes. So he, I have over here on my notes, um, God is our father. He has created the world we reside in. He has created man. And he created a way in which we can spend eternity with him. The authority that he has sure develops the rest of the prayer. So let's look at the rest of the prayer. So we see this word hallowed. And if you're not familiar with the word hallowed, it means holy or sacred. So when we're speaking this, when you pray, say, our father in heaven, holy is your name. When you do a word search on the word holy, holy, you come back all the way to the book of Samuel that we read. And if you recall, Hannah was Samuel's mother. And, and Hannah, all she wanted was a son. She couldn't have a child and she just wanted a baby boy. And she, she sings this prayer when God grants her requests. My heart rejoices in the Lord. My horn is exalted in the Lord. I smile at my enemies because I rejoice in your salvation. No one is holy like the Lord. That would be a good place for that word hallowed. No one is holy like the Lord, for there is none besides you, nor is there any rock like our God. <clears throat> so um, we just see this great description of the word hallowed, and it's a really captivating story that comes out of the Bible, I'm, I should, instead of saying story, even though I mean historical account, I don't, I don't want people to think that this is a fable. This, is, this actually happened. So I'm going to say this historical recollection. So the next part of the disciples' prayer that they were told is they're wishing for God's kingdom to come. Now, if we're asking ourselves what is meant by that statement, we could flip to the very last chapter Actually, I think there's 22 chapters. The very last page of the Bible is Revelation 21, 22, if I'm not mistaken. And we see here Jesus, actually John describing what was given to him by Jesus. And then these verses we see, and I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also, there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city New Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. So, um, Uncle T Uncle Charlie and Tatia, you you in church this weekend. Everybody came to church this weekend at, at our little local one here. And by sheer chance or divine coincidence, we could say this topic was actually discussed about a new heaven and a new earth, and, and what they mean whether they be symbolic or whether they are figurative uh, in their speech. I take a literal position on this, which is a little bit different than what the pastor had said. And I do such because if you read this verse in context, you can actually see what's going on in the earth during the time of judgment. So we know that his kingdom is to come and that's what we're praying for as believers. We got to remember that. Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We're praying essentially that, you know, obviously we want everyone to be saved, but we're ready for God's judgment to come down on us. This is a powerful prayer, right? 
The last part is your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so in my notes here, I talk about when we pray, whose will are we asking to be done? Our own or God's? God's will. We're supposed to be praying in God's will. Now, we make lots of requests in our prayers because we're asking that, you know, Lord, please hear us on these items. But we, we make emphasis. If this is your will, that this person be healed or that their days be extended, we're just asking you to this to be aligned in your will. We're, we want our lives to be aligned with your will because the last thing that we want to do is be going against God. I mean, it was even Peter, when Jesus said that he was to be crucified, Peter said, far be it, Lord, which would be the opposite of what God's plan was for Jesus for us. And that's why Jesus responded to Peter, get behind me, Satan, because if Jesus didn't fulfill the path that God had set out for him, then Peter would be lost. We would be lost. Okay. So another good instance, if we were to talk about God's will being done here, I look back to Hannah, Samuel's mom, okay? When we look back on Samuel's mom's prayer, we see a woman calling out. She was barren, and it was, it was in God's will for her to have a child. However, look at the result of his, speaking of God's, perfect timing versus what she would have wanted with immediate gratification. So, if God would have answered her prayer all throughout her younger years to have this child, then Samuel wouldn't have been the prophet that took over from Eli. It was within God's will to have a replacement. And because this woman was so devout in her prayers, her prayer was answered, but it was also aligned with God's will. That's when we're praying, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In the very next section, we see Jesus casting out the mute demon. And uh, this is just a terrifying picture to me. Um, and even though it's almost like a childlike drawing, it kind of gives me the chills, to be totally honest, when, when we look at something like this, because this is the reality. This is the reality. And if you recall from our study in John, where he also records, actually, I believe it was in Matthew as well, uh, the mute being able, or having Jesus being able to cast the demon out of the mute, everyone's freaking out over this because there was a ritual that traditionally was passed down through Solomon on how to exercise, not like on a, on a radio bike, but exercise a demon out of an individual one of the requirements was that the demon would have to provide his name. So if the individual who was demon possessed was mute, it just doesn't happen that way. And obviously this isn't, this isn't even a small task for Jesus. He just says, uh, a uh, bye-bye, you know, <laughs> and out comes this demon and the religious leaders of the day, right? This is all, this is all going to make so much sense in a second. The religious leaders of the day who are essentially evil, right? We're going to talk about their eye being the lamp. They're seeing bad. They're not seeing good. They're making this bold proclamation that the only reason this man has the authority to do this is because it's been granted to him by Satan. And that's like, I can't believe, I can't believe how bad that is. And we got Shelly trying to jump in. So I can't believe how bad that is for them to make such a nasty proclamation. And we see some clarity coming from Jesus here, right? So in the next slide, title it, Jesus Clears the Muddy Water. Let's see if it pulls up. Okay. So he lays it down for them. Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation. And a house divided against a house falls. If Satan is all, also is divided against himself, how will his kingdom stand? Because you say, I cast out demons by Beelzebub. And if I cast out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore, they will be your judges. But if I cast out demons with the finger of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. This is uh, such 
an instance for them, for him to be winking at them like, hey, you guys are missing. This is something great that's happening here. This is, this is your visitation that explains the Old Testament about the Messiah coming near, God's kingdom coming near, things that are being done that have never been done. Yes, there was this ritual in order to exercise a demon out of someone. Nobody ever heard of it being done through a mute. Or how about raising someone from the dead? Or how about, you know, the multitudes feeding 5,000? These are things that are happening. And he's letting them know the kingdom of God is visiting you. You're, this, is, this is the time of the visitation, right? And so Jesus goes on here. When a strong man fully armed guards his own palace, his goods are in peace. But when a stronger than he comes upon him and overcomes him, he takes from him all his armor in which he trusted and divides his spoils. He who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters. Okay? So I'm not going to break down this whole strongman uh, uh, topic here, but essentially, in a nutshell, you could say Jesus is the strong man. He's able to bind this individual. He's able to do these items when he's the stronger of the two. And that's how he has the authority to do such. And they're missing the point, right? So in the very next section of the, the next two verses in 24 through 26, it makes the claim, when an unclean spirit goes out of a man, he goes to dry places seeking rest and finding none. He says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when he comes, he finds it swept and put in order. And then he goes and takes with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself. And they enter and dwell there. And the, the state of that man is worse than the first. So there's two applications here that I'm going to talk about. And I really don't want to go deep into my commentary here, but I'm going to say that this, if you were to look at this without the other scriptures, almost to take it out of context and just read it as this, you could apply it to someone. Um, I have, and I, I, cause we're recording, I'm not going to say names, but it's just individuals growing up that I know that I was close with who had struggles with addictions. And then you see those individuals where they go through these various um, periods in their life where they have these highs and these lows and these highs and these lows. But if they're not turning to Christ, they're sticking with a ritualistic behavior for their, um, this change, they're leaving themselves open for the same problem, right? So if we were to look at some of these inmates, who, how they're lifers in the system, they never truly change. And each time they get caught, it's normally for something worse than what was passed. And so you could say that the last state of that man is worse than the first time. Okay. So that's my out of context commentary, right? Because we're, we're looking at that verse, those two verses just by themselves. But what we've learned in this Bible study is that it's very important to consider the text that preceded these verses where we're talking about Jesus casting out a demon of a mute that was unheard of. We see Jesus also talking about this generation seeking after a sign. We also see that this Jesus is being accused of having the authority to do such of these things because Satan has given him the power. He nails it down that there's no way that Satan would cast out Satan because his house is divided against himself right? And so we're still staying on the same theme, even though seemingly it sounds like something's a little different. So let's tie into the biblical application in context. And this is directly from one of these scholars on uh, that hermeneutic stack exchange. It says, um, therefore the action his disciples were to take to ensure that they do not just do a surface clean through vain religion but by faith receive Christ as the only strong man that alone can cast the kingdom of Satan from the heart. Otherwise, all one's religion and good works will be the perfect nest for every evil, okay? So again, the scholar is emphasizing on the fact that we just talked about a strong man, the strong man who, the strong man who has his house set up like this, but when the even stronger comes along, emphasizing that that's Christ, having authority over them, plundering that house, sending the unclean spirits away in ways that could never be done, recognize how that's being done, and that's through Christ, through his name, 
right? Through the authority given by Christ. Immediately after that, as he's sharing these things, we see this woman out in the crowd, can't contain herself. What does she say? Blessed is the womb that bore you and the breasts which nursed you, right? So this is a direct reference to Mary, okay? And I'm going to tell you what I think about this. We know that Mary was given, in my opinion, the most honorable position of any woman in history as far as mankind is concerned. Everyone would agree to that, okay? Jesus responds to the statement that more than that is actually or could actually be translated nay but, as in N-A-Y-B-U-T, nay but, as in furthermore or better than that, essentially, Blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. It's not debunking that Mary is blessed for having been given this opportunity to bear the son of God. It's that Jesus's message is about the word of God and keeping it. That's the point here. That's the, that's the, the, this special note, and that's directly from Christ when he's acknowledging the statement from the woman in the crowd. So Jesus then goes on and describes this generation, right? So now all the crowds are thickly gathered together, and he says, this is an evil generation. It seeks a sign, and no sign will be given to it except the sign of Jonah the prophet. For as Jonah became a sign to the Ninevites, so also the Son of Man will be to this generation. And I'll talk about the Queen of the South in a second. So in verse 16, if we go back a little bit, we see that others testing him sought a sign from heaven. That question that they were making when they were boldly making this heretical statement, he, he casts out demons by the rulers of the demons. They also made that comment, testing him, seeking a sign from heaven. So Jesus responds to them about how they're not going to get a sign, except what's already been spoken of in the Old Testament. And that's through the story of Jonah. So a couple things real quick. There's a lot of people who say that this story of Jonah and the whale and the Ninevites is, oh, this is figurative. You know, naturally a man couldn't survive inside of a fish, so on and so forth. And so they try and put a naturalistic approach as to appeal to an audience that might listen, but let's, let's get, let's get it straight. What makes our God so unique is that he works in the supernatural. This is not a natural event that occurred with Jonah. And it was not something that was natural that you would suspect for the Ninevites. So what do we draw as a conclusion from this? Well, before we go there, number one, Jesus, by using his words alone, authenticates the story of Jonah and the whale. Number one. Number two, who is he likening this generation to? Jonah went to the Ninevites. The Ninevites believed Jonah and recognized they were going to die. So they repented from their sins. Jesus, who says right here, is greater than he. And these people won't listen. They're not listening at all. To further that point, the queen of the south, right? We just read in that verse, the queen of the south will rise up in the judgment with the men of this generation and condemn them. Who is she? So... Queen of the South will rise up in the judgment with the men of this generation and condemn them. Who was the queen of the South? She was a Gentile woman. The Ninevites were Gentile people who heard something amazing from God and repented. This queen of Sheba, and I'll give you the, this is from one of the Bible study sites that I utilize. The Queen of the South had been a subject of many artistic works and legends. Some people also speculate that the Queen of the South is the same woman, the Shulamite, mentioned in the Song of Solomon because of the reference of the Shulamite's dark skin. However, there is stronger evidence to suggest that the Shulamite came from Shunem, 
a region near Israel. I disagree with that. We're going to move down because we know that she came from the South. Jesus mentions the queen of the South in the context of Israel's rejection to their true king. Though she was a Gentile, she traveled a long distance to hear Solomon. And the treasure she brought showed her respect for him and the wisdom he possessed. Okay. So if we go back to this verse, we can see we have Jesus describing the generation that's sitting in front of him who's seeking after a sign. What will he liken them to? Right? The sign that they get, Jonah became a sign to the Ninevites, so also the Son of Man will be to this generation. What do we know about? Well, okay, what are we talking about? Then we see the Queen of the South will rise up in the judgment with the men of this generation and condemn them. For she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. Christ is dropping the mic right here to them. And indeed, a greater than Solomon is here. The men of Nineveh will rise up in the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And what do we know right now? What's the next verse? And indeed, a greater than Jonah is here. He's giving them examples. He's letting them know of their visitation. He's even foreshadowing, just as Jonah was three days and three nights inside the belly of the whale, what do we know about Christ when he's crucified? Three days and three nights resurrected, okay? So Jesus is laying claim in these verses to being the son of God, the son of man, someone greater than Jonah, someone greater than Solomon, which they say, you know, they, they have whatever. So we'll move on. The lighting of the lamp. No one, when he is little lamp, puts it in a secret place or under a basket, but on a lampstand that those who come in may see the light. The lamp of the body is the eye. Therefore, when your eye is good, your whole body is also full of light. But when your eye is bad, your body also is full of darkness. Therefore, take heed that the light which is in you is not darkness. If then your whole body is full of light, having no part dark, the whole body will be full of light as when the bright shining of a lamp gives you light. Okay. Remember how we talked about we this demon who goes through, uh, a man gets this demon removed from him, but the demon goes out, goes through dry places, decides that he's going to go back to his home the person who he was demon possessed by, and we see this continual pattern. Well, this is another one of those verses that individuals like to, to talk about so much, so much to say to like garbage in, garbage out. You watch filth on TV, you listen to filth music, you, you participate in filthy behaviors, you're going to be filthy because that's all that you're putting in. That's all that's coming through your eye. So that darkness, that sinfulness is taking over your body. And it's, I'll be honest with you, it makes sense too when you think about it because you are less accustomed to negative change if you're continually saturated with it all the time. I.e., you look at the public school system. You see what the culture has dictated as something acceptable. They saturate the younger generation. And then when that generation grows up, the things that the generation before see on TV, they're appalled. I can't believe this is what's happening on TV that they said that or this and that because it would have never happened during our time frame, right? It, it's, it's plain as day to see here. But when we're reading the Bible, something that pops out like that, most of the time pastors will grab a section like this and they'll preach an hour long sermon about this, this part here. What we know is the way that the scripture has been designed is it fits with all the other scripture and it's all in context. So how does this fit into this scenario when we scale back several verses, we're talking about the Lord's prayer on how we're supposed to pray. Immediately after that, we see a mute being, uh, um, a demon being cast out of a mute, which is unheard of. We then see that the, the religious leaders, this is like the highest of the high people there are saying the only way that he could do this is if he had power from Satan. And then we see Jesus just laying the hammer down on them with all the Old Testament scripture foreshadowing of him. And then we have this section here, okay? I believe that this section's here because 
I'm going to read it right here. In verse 29, we see an evil generation seeking after sign. In verse 31, we see a queen seeking wisdom through Solomon. It is almost a comparative. We see a group of Gentiles traveling far and wide to see Jesus, but these religious leaders wait for Jesus to come to them, and then they seek a sign. Jonah went to a wicked nation and told them to repent. They did and were saved. Jesus has to come to the Jews but their self-righteousness stops them from seeing the light. So much so that when he comes like Jonah, they call him a person in subjection to the rulers of the demons. The word is good and perfect. If our eyes are on that which is perfect, we will emulate that perfect perfection and display that light. So what's happening here is it's a recognition of these individuals being in darkness. It may not be perceived as darkness because the things that they're, they're laying claim to are righteous. Doing the deeds of the law, completing these various tasks, doing such and such, tradition, 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 task, task, task. However, those items were additions to the law. And they were bearing those burdens on others who couldn't complete them themselves. Therefore, they were darkness. So how can they see light? Their saturation, their constant saturation is that of darkness. So this is another text that brings into um, consideration the cha Matthew chapter 6. And this is, again, this is not me. This is coming from one of these, these Bible study pages. It says, Jesus said, the eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are good, your whole body will be full of light. That's Matthew chapter six. It's very similar to what we just read here. Here, are, here our Lord describes the eye as the lamp, which lights the entire body. Our eyes are meant to entrace, our, I'm sorry, our eyes are the entrance to our hearts and minds. And as such, they provide a doorway to our very souls. When he referred to good eyes, he meant eyes that not only see well, but also perceive well. It is not only what we see, but how we perceive what we see that makes the difference between godliness and ungodliness, between light and darkness. Bad eyes lead to bad perception. But if our eyes are good, our whole person will be illuminated. If we are in a lighted room, we see everything clearly. We can move around obstacles and locate whatever we're looking for, but walking in darkness results in stumbling falling and groping for some secure thing to hang on to. Our eyes can be used to see that which is good or evil, that which is beneficial or harmful, and the things we see and perceive affect our whole being. If we perceive goodness, that will radiate outward within our hearts and minds. But if we allow our eyes to linger on evil, we are so affected by what we see that the darkness actually begins to emanate from within and can corrupt us and those around us. And this is, this is very interesting, okay? The Bible tells us that Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. That's his great deception. To make people think they found the light when in fact it's the darkness of false light. His intention is to blind us to truth and corrupt our minds. And he uses our eyes to gain entrance to our hearts. He parades before us all manner of evil from a deluge of pornography or the internet making up endless barrage of world's goods that appeal to our materialistic impulses. He deludes us into believing that these things will make us happy. Fulfilled people when all the while they are robbing us of the very joy we long for. He wants us to allow more and more darkness into our minds through the books we read, through the movies we watch, and the images we allow our eyes to linger upon. In that way, the light of glory of God shining in the face of Jesus Christ is obscured to us. Although the light is everywhere, like the sun at noonday, blazing, blinding light, if our eyes are continually focusing on sin, the light we perceive is not light at all. We want to be filled with the true light. We have to turn from sin, repent, and ask God to forgive us, cleanse us, and open our spiritual eyes. Then we must commit to being careful where we allow our eyes to go. We guard our hearts and souls by guarding our eyes. <clears throat> Final verse. 
my cousin, well, yeah, my cousin Christopher and I had a, had a discussion about this particular scripture today uh, pertaining to a movement inside what would be called Christianity today as the name it and claim it. So there's a group of pastors that are on TBN. They are um, like Joseph Prince. And um, there's another real famous one that's always on TV. He's on Oprah. Um, and there's this, this whole movement. It's called the Word of Faith movement. And essentially what their focus is on is how God's only promise for you is to be financially set, to be successful, and to be well-liked. And they call this the prosperity gospel. But the Bible tells us something different. It tells us to be prepared for persecution because the world will hate us for our beliefs because we tell them of the sins that they're committing so that they can repent. It's the opposite of what this whole name it and claim it movement is. And I'll be honest with you, this whole lamp scenario here seems to be speaking directly to this generation because this movement is huge. Millions and millions of people are into this study and, and how and I'm not going to get into it any further, but you'll see exactly what I'm talking about when we catch the tail or the very beginning of chapter 12 and the tail end of chapter 11, when we should have a realistic um, idea of what is coming our way as a true believer, okay? But let's get into the dinner invite, right? So, and as he spoke, a certain Pharisee asked him to dine with him. So he went in and sat down and eat. When the Pharisee saw it, he marveled that he had first, had not first washed his hands before dinner, okay? Uh, so what's going on here? If we scale back into the Old Testament, where Moses was getting instruction from God for Aaron, because Aaron was supposed to set aside the various priests and whatnot, we see this text in, starting in verse 17. You shall also make a labor of bronze, and its base also of bronze, for washing. You shall put it between the tabernacle of meeting and the altar, and you shall put water in it. For Aaron and his sons shall wash their hands and their feet in water from it, then, I'm sorry, when they go into the tabernacle of meeting or when they come near the altar to minister, to burn an offering made by fire to the Lord, they shall wash with water, lest they die, okay? So we could perceive from Luke that the Pharisees had derived some type of a tradition based upon the Mosaic, I'm sorry, the Mosaic law. I was going to say Mosaic covenant, okay? And that would be a, a fairly accurate deciphering. So if we jump over to the Gospel of Mark, we can solidify that question or that, that thought process when we see this. Then the Pharisees and some of the scribes came together to him, having come from Jerusalem. Now, when they saw some of his disciples eat bread with defiled, that is, with unwashed hands, they found fault. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands in a special way, holding the tradition of the elders. Okay, so now we know that it's a tradition that's been passed down. Let's further this even a little bit more. And as he spoke, a certain Pharisee asked him, and so when he sat down to eat, the Pharisee saw it, he marveled that he had not first washed his hand. That was the verse that we originally started with, right? This is a commentary out of Bible Hub that talks about uh, a, a certain rabbi, Rabbi Akiba, okay? And this is recorded in the Talmud. This is what it says. The Talmud has many references to these practices. Rabbi Akiba, it proudly relates, died of thirst rather than pass over these preliminary washings. Okay? So... They held this tradition, so to speak, to the point of death with this individual here. But what was the purpose? If, if, if we were to ask ourselves, what was the, what was the purpose of the, of the washing in the Old Testament? The purpose was, is that the individuals were unclean. They were defiled. 
they had they were they had sinned because everyone sins so this symbol of washing was cleansing them before they went into the temple because god doesn't dwell with sin right so it was symbolism that happened that then became tradition but who are we talking to we're talking to jesus is he did he was he dirty or defiled no absolutely not and I think a lot of commentators miss that point is the fact that that's who we're talking about. So <clears throat> shortly after this little section here where we talk about them, him, they're freaking out that he didn't wash his hands, Jesus addresses it. Now you Pharisees make the outside of the cup and dish clean, but your inward part is full of greed and wickedness. Foolish ones, did not he who made the outside of the cup, the inside also? but rather give alms of such things as you have, then indeed all things are clean to you. Woe unto you, Pharisees, for you tithe mint and rue and all manners of herbs and pass by justice and the love of God. They're so focused on the law. They're so focused on the details of following these, these rabbinical laws that they're bypassing justice. They're counting out seeds because they don't want to cheat God, so to speak, all the way down to the spices that they're cooking with. They're counting out nine for me, one for God, nine for me, one for God. And they're bypassing the fact of justice or the love of God. It's the love of their actions that make them righteous. And Jesus is calling them out. He's calling them hypocrites. You say one thing, but do the opposite. He tells him right here, you pass by justice and the love of God. These you ought have done without leaving the others undone. Woe to you Pharisees, for you love the best seats in the synagogues and greetings in the marketplaces. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like graves which are not seen and the men who walk over them are not aware of them. Okay, I, I wanted to look this one up. Do you remember the problem with the graves? If you touched a grave, you were considered unclean. So they would take these big, they called it whitewashing. They would put, um, I'm drawing a blank. They would put this, it, it's not, I, I would, I just would call it like white paint. I wonder if it's right here. Um, Okay, I can't, it's not in there. Uh, or maybe I didn't look hard enough. So anyways, they would have these whitewashed tombs and they would paint them bright white so that people, when they would come by, they wouldn't touch them inadvertently and then become unclean and then go into the temple while being unclean. Jesus is saying that these people are like graves that are buried underground which when regular men walk through are being made unclean because of their hidden hypocrisy, right? So for ye is our graves, which not appeared being covered with grass or which are not marked as the Ethiopic version renders it. That is, we're not whited or covered with lime as somewhere. So it was lime that they used, okay? And the men that walk over them are not aware. Christ compares the Pharisees because of their hypocrisy and secret iniquity with both whited sepulchers and to those that were not. To those that were, because like them, they looked beautiful without and righteous in the sight of men. And yet inwardly were full of all manner of pollution and sin, i.e. the dead bodies. And to those that were not, to signifying under the ground, because they did not appear to be what they were. And men were deceived by them and under um, specious, specious pretenses to religion and holiness. They were corrupt doctrines and practices unaware drawn into the commission of sin. Okay. <clears throat> so. <laughs> so Jesus is quite the dinner guest here, right? We see in this instance, the Pharisees are there. Woe to, you, woe, woe to you, Pharisees. You're foolish. You're hypocrites. You're this. You're that. You say these things. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees. Okay? We see their response. Now, luckily, there's a lawyer in the crowd, right? 
And I don't know if you guys can see that picture. That's a bunch of tombs in the background. I just put, kind of put it in there for effect. Anyways, we see the lawyers say, um, teacher, by saying these things, you reproach us also. <laughs> I just see the, woe to you also, lawyers, for you load men with burdens hard to bear, and you yourselves do not touch the burdens with one of your fingers. Woe to you. For you build the tombs of the prophets and your fathers killed them. In fact, you bear witness that you approve the deeds of your fathers. Remember, because they're all about their generation from Abraham, okay? We, we know who our fathers are. And, and they talk about their lineage in a way to where they're trying to say that Jesus was a bastard. You, I don't know if you guys remember that coming down from Matthew and from John, okay? We know who our fathers are, you know? So he's, he's addressing that here. Uh, in fact, you bear witness that you approve the deeds of your fathers, for they indeed killed them, and you built their tombs. Therefore, the wisdom of God also said, I will send them prophets and apostles, and some of them they will kill and persecute. That the blood of all the prophets which was shed from the foundation of the world may be required of this generation. From the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, who perished between the altar and the temple. Yes, I say to you, it shall be required of this generation. Woe to you, lawyers. For you have taken away the key of knowledge. You did not enter in yourselves, and those who were entering in you hindered. Ah, I can't imagine being told that. No, it's one thing to make a mistake on your own and to do it wrong, but to intentionally not allow someone else to get it right so that they can join into your tradition or whatever it is that's going on here and then stop them from entering into knowledge oh that's that's a that's a rough statement to hear that's why at the at the end of each one of these right guys it's not what Elliot says it's what the bible says we we, we always have to utilize whatever the bible says as the go-to right it's not what man's approach or man any of this it's what god said in the word of god and that's what we try and emphasize so you could imagine that the scribes, lawyers, Pharisees, whoever else might be in that room might have taken a little offense to the things that Jesus had to say because he basically showed them all of the errors in their ways and how they were hypocritical, um, actually starting all the way from the point in which he cast out the demon in the man that was mute. And we see their response here. Um, and as he said these things to them, the scribes and Pharisees began to assail him vehemently and cross-examine him about many things, lying in wait for him, seeking to catch him in something he might say that they might accuse him. They wanted him dead because of this interaction. And they were not happy. So I included part of chapter 12 in the beginning of this. Perfect timing can't believe it's already been an hour. They, they, I included part of chapter 12, these seven verses here, because it directly relates to the dinner invite, so to speak, talking about the Pharisees, talking about food, talking about having a problem with eating with unclean hands, so on and so forth. Jesus throws this, throws this in. When an innumerable multitude of people had gathered together so that they trampled one another, he began to say to his disciples, first of all, Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. And then he goes into great detail here. For there is nothing covered that will not be revealed, nor hidden that will not be known. Therefore, whatever you have spoken in the dark will be heard in the light. And what you have spoken in the ear in inner rooms will be proclaimed on the housetops. And I say to you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body, and after that have no more that they can do, but I will show you whom you should fear. Fear him who after he has killed has the power to cast into hell. Yes, I say to you, fear him. Are not five sparrows sold for two copper coins and not one of them is forgotten before God. But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Do not fear, therefore, you are more, you are of more value than many sparrows, okay? This is a clear indicator of Jesus's friends, what can be anticipated, okay? He's letting them know, 
And I say to you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body. <laughs> They're not going to like what he has to say. People are not going to like when we say, when we say the truth. It is undoubtedly, unequivocally true that people do not like to hear truth in this generation. There is all these new talks about living your best life, living your truth. That's the way I feel. So that's just, that's, that's my truth is what you hear. That's not truth. That's not wisdom. That's ignorance. Okay. This is truth. So I'm going to shut it off right there. The last thing that I want to note is beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. If you guys remember, we did a small little study on leaven. Leaven was what they would add into bread to make it rise. It was the yeast. It was the puffing up. So it's the sin, this, this self-elevating. It was something that was additional that didn't need to be there. So, and Jesus utilizes this, which I think he utilizes it because it was all about this food, con food conversation in the chapter prior. So that's the end of chapter uh, 11. Make sure you read chapter 12. Our homework again was to start a conversation with someone about Jesus. I know that I can give credit to uh, Mr. Mike, because I know that he had brought in someone to church with him and his wife was trying to take credit for it. Um, and then I'm going to go, I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording real quick. And let's see, where's that at?